In tonight's episode, Joe Bonanassa, Carlin James, and Tom Jones. <laughs> Joe Bonamassa, The Ballad of John Henry from 2009. Now, Joe Bonamassa is probably one of the busiest people in the rock world. He's constantly putting albums out um, and doing collaborations with all sorts of people. He did the Black Country Communion thing with Glenn Hughes and Co. And he also did some albums with Beth Hart as well, didn't he? Um, he's a very busy chap. Uh, he seems to like putting albums out very, very regularly. Um... This is going back now to 2009, and this was around about the time, I suppose, when I first sort of got to hear, I think Slow Gin was the album that had come out before this one, which was the first one that I heard, and this one sort of follows on from the success of that and the Live From Nowhere in particular album. So after that, then he went into the studio with Kevin Shirley again and came up with um, what I think is probably need a better album than Slow Gin in the shape of Ballad of John Henry. It's got quite a lot of interesting little things on it. It's, it's dirty, it's gritty, it's bluesy, but it's it's polished where it needs to be and there's a great there's a feeling of sort of class and quality on there as well. It's yeah, it's it's it's, it's got the dirt and it's got the grit but it's also got the polish. So we take a, a little bit of a more in-depth look at some of the tracks. Now, the, the opening track is the title track, Ballad of John Henry, and it's one of those sort of strutting, stomping riffs with a driving rhythm and an instantly singable vocal melody. The quieter parts of the verse helps to accentuate the power of the chorus and also adds to the overall quality of the track. It's proper rock blues crossover, this. It's rock blues crossover at its best, to be honest, and despite being the subject of a million blues-related tracks, this has got a far more sort of rock feel about it, and a bit around the two, two and a, two and three quarter minute mark is straight out the Led Zeppelin songwriting book. It's pure rock by the time you get to that bit. It's probably my favourite track on the album, and you could argue it's one of the best tracks that he's ever recorded. Now, the track that comes next is a real strange one for me because it's. When I saw it, and I saw it on the you know, on the album cover before um, I heard it, and I thought it can't be that track. And then, of course, it was. Uh, the track is Stop. Now, it's a cover of the Sam Brown hit. Now, Samantha Brown, as she likes to call herself. Now, um, and that is pure, that track is pure 80s pop genius. It really is. And you're thinking, well, why is a bloke who's a blues rock rock, how's he going to do that? I mean, how's that going to work? It just isn't, is it? And, and I didn't think it, it would have a chance. Not, not just because uh, Sam Brown, female vocal, and it was a pop hit and all that. It was just, I just didn't see how it was it was going to work. Um, and when it started, our first day, I thought, well, actually, it's not that song at all, is it? You just nicked a bit of it and, but it was, it, it's, <laughs> I don't know, I'm just going to say to people, you've got to go and listen to this, you play the Sam Brown version, and then play this version, um, and obviously nobody's going to tell me that, that, that there ever could be a version better than the Sam Brown version, because everyone knows that Sam Brown is one of my favourite female singers, or favourite singers, full stop, but this is, it's credible, it's, it, it's, it's not, it's, it's not, nonsense which is what it seemed to it was going to be to me how on earth he came across it and um, what made him do it i really don't know i don't know if anybody's ever asked him i've not bothered trawling through internet interviews to try and find out but uh, it would be it would be interesting to find out where the idea came from because it's such an unlikely choice to cover you just wouldn't believe it but it, it's a very different arrangement until you get to the chorus it's it's, it's slower and it's bluesy and Joe Bonamass is doing his best Paul Rogers impression to try uh, and his guitar and his, his sound a little bit like Cossot in places in some places it's not unlike Heartbreaker era 3 which actually went on to record a few 
Years later, I mean, everybody knows I'm a big, big fan of Sam Brown. It's a credit to Joe Bonamassa that despite the fact that he's taken a song which will forever, in my mind, belong to Lord Austin, he's given it a different lease of life. It's almost just what we call sort of stop version two. Uh, I'll be interested to find out um, what Sam Brown thinks of it, actually, and... After that, we get Last Kiss, which has got a real pounding drum beat and soaring and steam drain guitar, is what I call it. It's classic blues rock in a Bonamassa style. It's easy to see why he fancied a crack at being in an out and out rock band with uh, Glenn Hughes and stuff when you listen to this, because you can tell that he's, he's got those leanings towards wanting to, 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 to try that as well. He still manages to go off on a more standard bluesy ending during its seven minutes plus lifetime, so it's no, it's no short little interlude trap this one it's pretty good then we get another call we get tom waits's jockey full of bourbon uh, that's a different beast altogether it's jazzy it's funky but it's really dark as well it's got a sleazy vocal not, not like willie the pimp if you're aware of that song a heavy blues riffing power of the guitar comes in between the verses and it, it makes a superb contrast it's 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 pretty good stuff even Something that sounds curiously like a banjo in there somewhere, but I can, I can't find any credit for anybody playing one on the on the sleeve, so I don't know whether I've just missed it or, or, or whether there's something going on with my ears or it's some sort of guitar style or, or something else. I don't know, but there are people who know better than me. If you do know, in the comments, please. The chugging solo over the honky tonk bar and piano to fade gives a song an interesting and a good. Ending. Then we've got the story of a quarry man, and that's got another one of those dirty rock riffs throughout, and it's probably more of a hard rock track on a blues track again. Power rather than finesse is certainly to the fore. Then Lonesome Road Blues is another almost faster paced version of I just want to make love to you, really, vocal melody wise, over the top of a pretty standard crossroads type blues groove musically. It's just straight up British blues boom music, really. It's three minutes of good, solid. Fun. Then we get Happier Times. That's another Bonamassa epic that starts off slowly with some nice Spanish sound and acoustic guitar over the electric backing. Bonamassa's almost whispered vocal gives it a nice atmosphere. And the guitar sound somehow manages to remind me of Richard Blackmore in places, particularly on the acoustic parts. And the part around the three and a half minute mark also brings to mind Blackmore's work on the Fireball album. Feeling good is usually more of a vehicle for singers and Bonamassa manages a decent, good jazz blues delivery of that. Music wise, it's got a nice jazzy feel to it as well. One well, of the guitar so is probably one of the weakest on the album. It provides quite a contrast to the main body of the song as it's more in a rock vein, but it does work well. Now, possibly an even bigger surprise than Stomp from earlier on the album is the track that comes next because it's funkier than a mosquito's tweeter. And now, that's not my description of it. That's what it's called. <laughs> it features some big time solo work and it really is a totally different sounding song to all of the others on the album. It's got elements of jazz. It's got elements of funk. It's got elements of soul. It's even got a bit of Motown in there to go along with the blues and the hard rock. The final solo veers effortlessly between Hard Rock on Blues, and it's a perfect ending to a completely enjoyable song. It was originally recorded by I Can Tina Turner. It's the third cover on the album that shouldn't really work, but somehow it does. Sometimes it would seem that it is brave. It, it pays to be brave and, and, and take these chances, and, and, and they work, because none of the covers that we've spoken about so far are out and out covers. They've, they've all taken the song in a different direction the great flood is next and that's the longest song on the album and the opening riff almost has like polished black sabbath you, i mean you can tell from this that bonamass is taking elements from, from from everywhere and giving them his own little sort of feel uh and his own spin it's, it's not like when we can say well he's copying there he's copying there he's not he's taking a style or an idea and then he's moulding it into his own sort of thing uh, and the fact that it's you, you can hear the elements of what presumably influenced him in the first place 
is good. I mean, it may well be that, that, that those things didn't, and it's just coincidence. It's just my ears that are picking up these things. As we said before, I'm just saying it the way I see it or the way I hear it. Uh, my opinion, not the opinion of everybody else. And again, you all tell me what you think in the comments below or on the crushed custard Facebook page, which you're all welcome to come and join. So back to the great flood then with the sort of polished black summer star. It's demonic, it's haunting, and then it, it, you've got the, the vocal and soloing over the top. They're almost more zippling, if you like, if you want to make them sound like something in that sort of zippling rock blues vein as well. It's... Um, it's a, really, it's, a, it's a really good, interesting, complex song. None of these songs are just simple songs. They're all got a lot of thought in them. They all go somewhere and they all do something, which is makes it a great listening experience anyway. Um, the guitar on that may be possibly the best blue soloing on the album. I, I don't know. I'm not, again, not that much of an expert, but to me, that does sound like it's probably the best soloing on, on the album from a, from a blues point of view rather than a rock point of view anyway From the Valley is next that's instrumental it's also the shortest song on the album again it's got that, 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 a bit of a feel of those Zeppelin instrumental things about it without it being just copying um, there's nothing wrong with doing these type of things and, and with that it's not just a Zeppelin feel you, you can chuck a bit of the East of Mysticism. But yeah, all right, Zeppelin and Robert Plant in particular did particularly like that, but then you've also, you can chuck a bit of Django Reinhardt in there as well if you, if you want to really start to analyse it. Good stuff. Closing track, As the Crow Flies, is a nice stomping blues rocker that's not unlike early Free, and we obviously we all know that Joe Bonamassa was a big fan of Free and played some Free tracks live and on some of his earlier and indeed later albums as well um the description of free quite often is flat tires on a muddy road and that easily springs to mind when you're describing this particular track it's got that sound the influence on paul rogers on the way but joe madamas is trying to sing he's obviously quite everything he's obviously listened to paul rogers and he's trying to get that type of phrasing and that type of um that type of, of, of vocal, which is, if you if you want to base yourself on anybody, base yourself on the best. That's got to be the way, hasn't it? Um, the track, and of course, therefore, the album, ends with a good jazzy blues rock solo to fade out. It's probably not the ideal ending to the album, song ones, but everybody knows I do bang on quite a lot about placement and all that sort of stuff, and whether there's was something better to end the album, I don't know, I'm sure I probably could have, if I'd had time to sit working out, have, have come up with something, but anyway, that's what we've got at the end, and of course, in the days of CD, as we say, we can jiggle them about, and we can change the order as much as we like anyway, so it probably isn't even worth mentioning. Uh, the Ballad of John Henry, then, 2009, Joe Bonamassa, it's a it's a mighty fine album for me, it's probably, oh, it's probably got to be close to being my favourite Joe Bonamassa, um, I haven't heard all of them, but of the ones I have heard, I think it probably is the best one. It's a perfect example of a little bit of imagination and rearrangement when it comes to covers can prove to be extremely beneficial. Just, if you want to take somebody else's song, put your own spin on it. And if you're going to put your own spin on it, put a big spin on it. And, and that's what Joe Badamassa does with the covers on this album, which I think is to his credit. Uh, and it's, it's great. Um, it's just enough blues on this album to keep those people who, who see him as the, as, as, the, as the great new sort of blues champion to keep keep them happy as well as throwing enough hard rock bits in there to keep the keep the rock boys happy and and the sort of more rockier people are, are, are seeing Joe Bonamassa as a sort of natural progression on from Rory Gallagher and Gary Moore aren't they um, at least they were then whether they still are now I, 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 I wouldn't be quite so sure, but certainly going back to 2009, it was very much a case of Joe Bonamassa could be following in, in that sort of vein. So, yeah, take the guitar playing, uh, which is top-notch singing, which is 
above average for um, a, what you would call a non-frontman vocalist, the ability to take pop songs, classic old crooner material, and sort of all sorts of covers and things, and just turn them into something of your own and all sit happily together. And you've got a good album, man. It's it, it's a very good album. It's well worth listening to. If you've not given Joe Bonamassa a go, give him a go. And this is the one I'd put it towards. Joe Bonamassa, Battle of John Henry. Top stuff. The Man in the Attic. Hello, fellow custodites. Um, it's the Man in the Attic. Except I'm not in the attic. I'm in my kitchen. So I am the man in the kitchen. Except I'm the man in the attic. If that makes sense. It's a bit hot today, so I just thought I'd have a little change of venue. Um, I've got lots of my CDs on shelves in my dining room, which is kind of uh, over this way. And I just thought I'd pull one off and... Um, tried to find one that might fit in with uh, I know the other ones that Martin's doing in this episode and I came up with this one Colin James Sudden Stop Colin James it was his second album it was released on Virgin Records 1990 this is CD it's a bit of a change but um, yeah I don't have any vinyls downstairs they're all up in the attic so this is CD this time and uh, who is Colin James? Well, Colin James is, um, this was his second album, and he's still recording, still touring. He's done several swing albums, um, and he is very, very good. Where does he come from? He comes from Canada, from Saskatchewan, Regina, in Saskatchewan. And he got a bit of a break in 1984, he was asked at very short notice to do a support slot for Stevie Ray Vaughan in Regina. And Stevie Ray Vaughan was so impressed that he took Colin James and his band on tour with him in the States. Um, he actually, that night of that gig, asked him to do the encore with him. So, you know, if you can impress Stevie Ray Vaughan, you've got to be good. Um, so what is he like, Colin James? Well, yeah, he is very good. Yeah, he's a blues rocker. If that is no doubt, well, you'd have to be, you know, Stevie Ray Vaughan, blues rock legend. So there you go. Um, and what's this album like? Well, I made a, I made a, a few notes about the tracks. And um, it's a 10-track album. And Colin James is guitar, vocals. Um, and he was kind of, I suppose, a bit like maybe a Joe Bonamassa-esque figure in his day. Well, it's still his day because he's still about. What do we get? We get 10 tracks, um, all pretty uh, pretty well produced. Good, nice sound to the album. Good, nice snappy drum sound. Good crunchy guitars. And uh, there's lots of brass and... Um, uh, there's a sax player in the van, in the band, and uh, also they use a horn section on other parts. Really good female backing vocals. And so what did we get? Well, we've got track one. Just came back. That's sort of uh, strange in that it starts off with uh, a kind of dobro version of Stones in My Pathway, and you can see uh, Colin James has got a dobro in his hand on the front of the CD booklet. And, but it morphs into this uh, this track, Just Came Back, which is a really, really good up-tempo blues rocker. Track two we've got is called Keep On Loving Me Baby. I think it's an Otis Rush song, and it's a, it's a really, really good blues stomper. Um, quite, actually quite Stevie Ray Vaughan-esque. Um, we have Show Me. Uh, on track three, it's another fine blues tinged rocker. And then we have a, a, bit, a little bit of a change on track four. We have a, a guest appearance by Bonnie Raitt, no less. Um, Give It Up, it's got a slightly reggae ish feel and that kind of Caribbean feel to it. We get uh, Crazy Over You 
at number five, which is a good slow blues tune. And then at six, we've got one called T for Trouble. Now, as you might gather from the title, that comes on as a really good full-on rocker. It really does rock out nicely. We've got a one called Cross My Heart at number seven. That's a good high-energy mid-paced tune. There's, there's a good upbeat feel to all of this album. Really, really good upbeat feel. At track eight, we've got one called Just One Love, which is a really storming tune, really storming, and a fantastic driving bass line on it. Really, really good. And you've got quite a commercial uh, track, uh, number nine, called If You Lean On Me. It's got really good sax work in it. Really, again, those great crunchy guitars. Really, really good chorus. Great female backing vocals. Really, really excellent stuff. And the album concludes with the title track called Sudden Stop, which is a great slow brooding tune. Really nice guitar work. I mean, and he does have a lovely tone to his electric guitar work. Really, really nice. Um, and and I, I would say it's one that you'd get the lighters out to. Yeah. You can imagine, or it'd be your mobile phones these days, wouldn't it? A strong vocal from Conan James on it. It's, and I think, probably the best track on the album. Really, really nice brass arrangement on it also. Now, Conan James isn't, uh, I have to report, his real name. He's really called Colin Munn. M-U-N-N. And apparently, legend has it, that Stevie Ray Vaughan, suggested to him uh, the change because the name Mun came across at um, arena venues across uh, on the PA system sounding like mud so uh, it was thought it might be best to change so yeah a good a good album all in all you don't get lyrics in this booklet you get a kind of you know who played on it, who produced it. Um, a little photo of the band in the middle. Again, there's some nice keyboard work on the album, you know, like, again, quite, actually quite Stevie Ray Vaughan-esque. Um, and yeah, that's, that's what you get. And there's the back of the CD case. Front's a bit bad. Uh, I've had this album quite a long time but yeah a good album I think I do have one other of his of his albums but I remember hearing that song Sudden Stop on the radio and thinking yeah I quite like that so I've got the album on the strength of it and um, it's a really enjoyable listen so yeah Colin James a blues rocker along with the others that will bookend this in this episode of Crush Custard so um, yeah this is been the man in the kitchen but I'm the man in the attic so again I'll see you very very soon and it's 2008 and I'm in Cannock in Staffordshire and I'm just going to meet somebody for a drink now it's pouring around it's a horrible miserable day and I find myself getting to this pub where I'm supposed to be going and it is a right ramshackle old dump of a place I can't remember what it's called it's probably just as well because it might upset somebody about <laughs> where it was. Anyway, I go in this pub and it's it's almost like I've stepped back in time because it's like like something with a second world war or something. It's I don't know, I've made over since then. I went to the bar, I ordered a drink, the person I was right to meet wasn't there yet, and I got a drink sat down. Nobody in there apart from me. There will be on a bar and one old bloke in a flat cap with a dog. That's it. Nobody else in there. The place is massive. And it's eerily quiet. I sit down at this table and sit there and wait for the person I'm supposed to be meeting to arrive. And all of a sudden, there was this sort of crescendo of sort of noise. And it sounded like the introduction to a 60s pop song. And it bled out across this pub. And I thought, well, this is quite good. What is this? And then somebody started singing. 
Now, the person who started singing was unmistakable as Tom Jones. And I'm thinking, I've not heard this before. And it's a really, really good song. And I'm thinking, this is great. It's a proper classic piece of like 60s pop music. And I'm thinking, why have I never heard of this before? And then you start, your mind starts to wander and I think, I wonder if I've discovered time travel and I've just walked through that door. And the reason why this pub is so ramshackle and whatever is because I've walked through a time zone thing and I'm now back in the 60s. And this is a Tom Jones song, which didn't get released probably, wasn't it? I don't know. Anyway, and the DJ, well, the, the boy wants to pull the radio, and the DJ comes on and goes, that's a new single from Tom Jones, it'll be out in a couple of weeks. Um, I thought, hey, 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 this is good. I don't remember that at all. I bet that got pulled or something. If I can get hold of a couple of copies of that before it gets released, it's never been released. I'll be able to go back to my present time, 2008, and make a fortune. I've got ideas of being the bloke and good night sweetheart all over again. Sadly for me, the door opened in came my mate who I was supposed to be meeting, and my dreams of time travel were shattered beyond belief. Anyway, the point of the matter is, it's still stuck in my head, this Tom Jones song. And I thought, I not about that. Anyway, a week or so later, she did TV on a Friday night. And who comes on one of those chat shows but Tom Jones? And if Tom Jones is going to perform his new single, which will be released soon. On his forthcoming album. Oh, I think I might want to be already. And he goes and plays this song. And I thought, that's that song I heard in that pub. It's really, really good. And I thought, right. Now, at that point, I was doing a lot of written reviews and stuff. So I thought, oh, I'm going to have to black myself a pre-release copy of this. It's not in my sort of list of things that I normally do. So I said, can you check the new Tom Jones album? People looked at me like I was a bit weird. What do you want that for? I've heard it. Oh, I've heard a track off of it. It sounds really, really good. Anyway, I've got sent a copy of the aforementioned album, which 24 hours it's called, and it's almost like a throwback album to one of Tom Jones's um, earlier things from the, from the 60s and the early 70s. Forget all that sort of cabaret stuff and appearing on Mork on Wise and all that. Tom Jones is a bloke who can sing a song. He's got a decent set of pipes on him. And on this album, he does an absolutely superb job on most of it. I'm not going to tell you that it's a classic. You've got to buy it. Every single track is brilliant. Half a dozen of the tracks are really good. The rest of them might be a little bit filler-esque. But this is an album worth giving a listen to. It's one of those people who you just look at the name and you go, Tom Jones, I don't want to listen to that. Listen to it without any prejudice. And you might actually find you quite like it. The run of tracks which I would suggest you have a listen to are probably the opening five tracks. That's I'm Alive, If He Should Ever Leave You, which was that single that we were talking about. We Got Love, Feels Like Music, and Give A Little Love. They're all crackers. Really, really great things. Um, the two better tracks are the final two tracks, really. Seen That Face, which has got a really nice guitar solo at the end of it and the title track 24 hours which is almost Jacques Brel in a way which is is, is, is really good so ch take the middle part of the album out which is a little bit iffy but the first five tracks and the last two tracks really worth listening to I'll stick a link down on it um, and, and, and this did at the time totally amaze me Tom Jones 24 hours well worth a listen if you enjoyed tonight's episode please like and subscribe as it helps this channel to grow. See you soon.